Thank you so much for tuning in to our weekly Bible study on the upcoming Sunday Gospel reading. Wherever you're watching this from, we would love for you to join us in person on Monday nights at 7.30 at St. Timothy in Laguna Niguel, but we love having this available so you can connect with our community in another way. So as you do, please like this video, comment any questions or reflections you have on the readings below so we can reply to you, and please especially subscribe to our channel so you can be notified whenever we have a new Bible study video or any number of the other videos that we make. So without further ado, let's get into our gospel reading for this upcoming Sunday. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the beauty and gift of this day, being with like-minded community in a community of faith, and all of the ways that your graces and abundance blessed us today, especially in ways that went unnoticed. We pray tonight, Lord, that our hearts, minds, and ears would be open to listen and receive whatever you have in store for each one of us. And especially in the ways that we are seeking and longing, whether it be for joy or peace, answers, consolation, direction, whatever it is, Lord, just to offer that to you and trust that you will fulfill the longing and desire in each one of our hearts. That you already are planning to speak words of truth and goodness to each one of us tonight. And so help us to be ready to listen. We ask that you, in your name and in your goodness, Jesus, cast out any presence of the enemy, any worry, anxiety, doubt, or fear that might be distracting us from this time. And we lay this time in our very lives at your feet, Lord, asking that your will would be done. Bless us each in the ways we most need it. And we pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. Come on in. We are in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. This is the gospel reading for this upcoming Sunday, which is the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Sunday the 13th. Um, and that is where we are tonight. Jairus' daughter and the woman with a hemorrhage. These are the stories we're reading. And in every gospel where this appears... I referenced this a few weeks ago. Uh, it appears as an intercalation, meaning that the situation with the hemorrhaging woman interrupts the story of Jesus healing Jairus' daughter. It's always presented that way, and so we'll kind of explore that and why that is tonight. But it's a story you've probably heard many times. I invite you, as always, to start with a fresh blank canvas in your mind, as if you've never heard this story before and listen particularly for the details. Pay attention to your senses. What do you see, hear, smell, touch if you're in this story, placing yourself on the pages of sacred scripture? What do you notice as if uh, listening for the very first time? As we are in Mark chapter five, starting in verse 21. First time through, again, just get a sense for what is happening. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. Jesus went off with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet she was not helped but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see how the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you ask, Who touched me? And Jesus looked around to see who had done it. 
The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid, just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. The girl, a child of twelve, arose immediately and walked around. At that, they were utterly astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this and said that she should be given something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so now that you have this fresh in your minds, we're going to read this one more time. I know it's a lengthy gospel, but there's a lot here uh, that I think the Lord can speak through to each one of us. And so I invite you, follow along with the words. See if any particular word stands out to you personally. Again, this time through is not to interpret the passage theologically and get some deep, profound insight into what it means biblically, but to really ask, what does this mean for me? What is the Lord saying directly to me through this story? Pay attention to that, reflect on that, and ask the Lord why he might be revealing that to you. It's our second and final time through, Mark 5, 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials, named Jairus, came forward. Seeing him, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her, that she might get well and live. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for twelve years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet she was not helped but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately, her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see how the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you ask, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's home arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid. Just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of a commotion people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, 
little girl, I say to you, arise. The girl, a child of twelve, arose immediately and walked around. At that they were utterly astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this, and said that she should be given something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to take a few moments to reflect back on this passage and specifically the things that stood out to you personally. If you're watching or listening to this later, let us know what stood out for you. But for those of us here, uh, take that time and then share at your tables what stood out, why you think it did, what questions you have about this passage, and then we'll bring it back together in a large group for some teaching and some Q&A. So take about the next 10 to 15 minutes. So this is a, a long passage. <laughs> And in its length has many, many uh, contextual things that are related to the Old Testament. Many, many things that have, would have been apparent to the audience at the time, the people that were there, the people who first read about this uh, in the first century Israel. And so um, I want to take you back to the Torah, to the book of Leviticus. I know it's your favorite book to read um, in your spare time when you're just wondering, what were the priestly laws of the Old Testament? You're just really juicing for that. Um, but yeah, that was a poor choice of words. Um, there's a lot in the Torah, especially in Leviticus, about blood. Okay, uh, In Leviticus 17, verse 10, it says, As for anyone, whether of the house of Israel or of the aliens residing among them, so this is for anyone, who consumes any blood, I will set myself against that individual and will cut that person off from among the people. Since the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement on the altar for yourselves, because it is in the blood as life that makes atonement. And so this was a real sticking point for Jesus' teaching on the Eucharist. It's why we like can know definitively Jesus meant what he said when he said, like, my blood is true drink, my body is true food, because it was so antithetical to the Torah law, like Jesus would have been like grossing people out and basically help putting them in a position where if they didn't align with this new way, uh, then they were, uh, if they aligned with this new way, they were setting themselves completely against the Old Testament understanding of blood. And so this is where this whole sacrificial system comes from. And that's because if you believe that blood is the life force of the person or the animal, which makes sense, right? Like if you kill an animal, they bleed when their blood is drained, like they're not, they're not alive anymore. So it was a common conception at the time, just by logical deduction from hunting and things like that, that life, they believed, resided in the blood. And so if you had put yourself in a position where you had given yourself over to some small version of death by sinning, in order to reconcile yourself, to come back to full life in the Lord, you needed to offer substitutionary life, which was the blood of a sacrifice. That's why this whole sacrificial system made perfect sense to them, because sin robs you of life, and so you need to offer life back in order to be restored. And so blood was very sacred. If you came into contact with blood, you were considered unclean. In fact, there's a specific law in Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 15, about the exact situation that the hemorrhaging woman finds herself in. And this is Leviticus 15, verse 25. It says, when a woman has a flow of blood for several days outside of her menstrual period, or when her flow continues beyond the ordinary period, as long as she suffers this flow, she shall be unclean, just as during her menstrual period. Any bed on which she lies during the flow will become unclean, as it would be during her menstrual period, and any article on which she sits becomes unclean, just as it would be during her menstrual period. Anyone who touches them becomes unclean. That person shall wash their garments, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. When she becomes clean from her flow, she shall count seven days. After this, she becomes clean, and then on the eighth day, she offers a sacrifice. And so simply by being in a state where you are constantly pouring blood, constantly losing blood, you were considered perpetually unclean. Now, to be unclean did not mean it was a moral judgment against you. We often hear it that way, that there's something wrong with the woman. No, it just meant you were in a state where you were losing life. And because the temple, the place of sacrifice and worship, is a place where life is restored and offered, 
you are not worthy or able to come to the temple if you're in a position where life has been drained from you until that's reconciled. So the same thing would be true if you had a mortal wound, if you had bled because of battle or because of a fight, if you had lost kind of any bodily fluid um, in a way that was like um, indicative of life, so any kind of sexual fluids as well, these things carry the same uh, requirement to be restored to a state of being clean. And so this is the situation the hemorrhaging woman finds herself in. She can't sit on anything, touch anything, touch anyone, be in community with anyone. She's completely isolated from worship, from community. She's practically a leper. Nobody would go near her because of the sacredness of blood. It wasn't any moral judgment about her, though there were some people who believed if bad things happened to you, it was because you did something bad. But the law clearly says that that's not true. But that was an Old Testament belief that you sometimes see show up in parts of the law. So that's the sacredness of blood. And the same thing is true if you approach someone who has died, like Jesus does to Jairus' daughter. In Numbers chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Order the Israelites to expel from camp everyone with a scaly infection, everyone suffering from a discharge, and everyone who has become unclean by contact with a corpse. Male and female alike, you shall expel them. You shall expel them from the camp so that they do not defile the camp where I dwell in their midst. So again, because God's presence is in the camp, in the tabernacle, or later in the temple, and God is a God of life, we cannot defile this life of God by coming before him, not reconciled in the ways that we've lost life or in the ways that we're experiencing some version of death by sin, loss of life, loss of blood, etc. So if you come into contact with something dead, that is affecting you and you need to restore yourself in order to be made worthy to worship. And later on in Numbers 19, 11, it says, those who touch the corpse of any human being will be unclean for seven days. They shall purify themselves. It goes on to say, anyone who fails to purify themselves defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. These persons shall be cut off from Israel. So in the same situation as a hemorrhaging woman, the dead daughter, the hemorrhaging woman, both in a position where they've experienced some type of death, some type of loss of life. Now we might ask the question, well, why? Why does God let this happen? The age-old question of the problem of suffering. Well, this week's first reading answers that question. It's from the book of Wisdom, chapter 1. It's a verse I often quote where it says, God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. So God's purpose is not to condemn someone because of death. It's to restore them. And that's why they have the whole sacrificial system. That's why they have the laws that they do. So they don't put themselves in a position where they will defile other people. But they are invited into a process that will restore them back to full life in the Lord. And so all of that would have been immediately apparent. They see a woman bleeding, touching Jesus. That would have been horrifying to them. They see Jesus reaching out and touching the hand of a child who has died. That would have been horrifying to them because that meant unclean. Nearly 100% of the time it meant unclean, except if you were approaching the Lord. The Lord was approaching you. You don't have the same relationship. So if I'm unclean and I touch an object or I touch one of you, you become unclean. That's just how it works. It just spreads like a virus, but it's a, it's a state of being worthy of worship. But if I come before the Lord, or if the Lord comes and purifies me, I don't make the Lord unclean because he can't be unclean. He purifies me and makes me clean. We have an example of this in the uh, prophet Isaiah. In chapter 6, when Isaiah is called, he is taken into the Holy of Holies in the temple, and he has this vision of angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And he says, Isaiah says, Woe to me, I am doomed, for I am a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So it says, one of the seraphim, one of the angels, flew to me, holding an ember which he had taken with tongs from the altar, taken something holy from a holy place in the holiest place of the temple. He touched my mouth with it. See, he said, now this has touched your lips. Your wickedness is removed, your sin purged. 
So only when we come into contact with God himself or the divine itself are we able to be made clean. That's what the sacrificial system did. That's what this vision of Isaiah and the angels in the temple was meant to communicate. And so if Jesus approaches those who are unclean, or if they approach him and touch him, and instead of him becoming unclean, they are cured, that means that Jesus is divine. That means Jesus is God-like or God himself. It would have been immediately apparent to those who witnessed these things, seeing a state of uncleanliness restored immediately before their eyes. They immediately would have known that source that caused that is not anything of ordinary human condition or nature. Because if he had been, he would simply now be unclean. But because some supernatural miraculous effect happened, it would have been obvious to them there's something divine and special about Jesus. We've already seen him heal. Heal the blind, the mute have heard, the lame have walked, he's driven out demons, he calmed the storm at sea. Remember we talked about last week, signifying his power over the fake gods of the Canaanite people. And now he's asserting this in very Jewish uh, symbols, in a very Jewish structure, showing that all of your laws that protect you from uncleanliness, I have come to supersede those and make you clean and restore you back to me. That's what's happening here. And this is exactly how God is described in the Old Testament. Isaiah 25, verse 8. The Lord will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from their faces. Ezekiel 37, verse 13. You shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and make you come up out of them, my people. All of this to signify Jesus is God. That would have been apparent to the witnesses. Now, there's something interesting here about um, what happens with the hemorrhaging woman. She reaches out, and does she touch Jesus? No. What does she touch? His cloak. What on his cloak specifically? I heard it. The tassel. The tassel on his cloak. This is one place in Scripture, in fact, the only place that I can think of, that we have evidence of second-class relics. Okay, We have evidence of all three types of relics in Scripture, actually. A first-class relic is the bone or body of a saint. We have evidence of this in, uh, I believe, 2 Kings, where someone is being buried in the tomb of Elisha, the prophet, and their body touches his bones, and they immediately come back from the dead. Because his bones contain such holiness as we now call a first-class relic, has the power to imbue healing. A second-class relic is anything that has touched or was a possession of a saint. Anything they owned or was a personal possession of theirs. And so Jesus' tassel, his cloak, his shawl, would have been a second-class relic. And it sees here that it is healed. And later on in the New Testament, we have Paul, people coming to Paul, touching him with handkerchiefs and bringing them back to other people to be healed. So when an object touches a first-class relic, the body of a saint, that's a third-class relic. And it still has that ability to heal. So all of those things are very scriptural. And so here we have this evidence of the second class. But what's interesting about this garment that Jesus is wearing, it's called a talit. And a talit is a prayer shawl that's indicative of rabbis. It shows the status of a rabbi. And the talit had two ends that were called the kanaf, the wings the wings of the prayer shawl. And at the end of the wings were the tzitzit, the tassels. And the tzitzit were tasseled and tied in such a way to signify certain prayers and laws in the Old Testament, to almost provide, almost like the equivalent of a modern-day rosary, something that someone could touch and be reminded of certain prayers or certain laws. It was almost like a, a memorization or mnemonic device in a very tangible way. And so to touch that was to touch this very holy garment that was indicative of prayer, restoring someone in right relationship with the Lord, being faithful to the law. But the interesting thing uh, about this garment is that it's obscurely referenced in the prophet Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament. And in chapter 3, verse 20, there's a prophecy about the need to serve the Lord and the promises of the Lord restoring his people. And it says this, But for you who fear my name, the sun of justice will arise with healing in its wings. And that word, therefore, wings, is the same word that's used in the Greek translation for tzitzit or kanaf, that prayer shawl, the wings of the shawl. 
And so Jesus, by being able to heal from the wings of his shawl, is invoking this prophecy from Malachi chapter 3, that he is this son of justice that is prophesied in the Old Testament, coming and bringing healing in this way. So all these really cool Old Testament images that are, that are emphasized here. But I think there's, there's some really beautiful things that are happening here just beyond that for our own personal reflection. And then we'll open it up to some questions. Um, and I, I love the last verse of this. She should be given something to eat. And yes, there's very Eucharistic you know, symbolism in that, right? Once she's restored to new life, very symbolic of baptism, what's the very next thing that you receive? The Eucharist. But I just love that small detail. Like Jesus just rose, well, he resuscitated someone from the dead. That's the distinction. The only resurrection that happens in scripture is Jesus. Everything else is a resuscitation. These people died again. Jesus did not die again. So there's a distinction. But he still brought them back from the dead. And then instead of seeing like, saying like, did you see that? Wasn't that awesome? Like I just, someone was dead and now they're not. I did that. He pays attention to this like small detail. Also like she might be hungry. And I just, I think that's a really important thing to like, to think about like God cares about the little details of your life. I think there's something to the story of the hemorrhaging woman where it speaks to this reality that some of us feel sometimes like, am I inconveniencing God? Does God have enough time for me? I don't want to burden him. I approach him with fear and trembling like she does, right? All she wants to do is reach out and touch his cloak. Jesus is not inconvenienced by you, brothers and sisters. You are not a burden to him or to anyone else. And I think oftentimes in our prayer, in our life, just maybe we're battling loneliness or different seasons in life, we can feel that way. I don't want to be an inconvenience to anyone. I don't want to ask big things of God because he's got to do with world hunger and war and all of these things. And, and he doesn't really care about me and, and if I'm just hungry. Yeah, he does. Give her something to eat. Yeah, I'm working miracles over here. Maybe you don't need a resuscitation miracle, but maybe you're just hungry. I care about that. I care about the small minutia of your life. And I want to be present to it. I want you to know that I love you in those places, that God cares about the little things. And brothers and sisters, he is also not afraid to come close and to touch those areas of your life where you need healing. To touch those areas of your life shrouded in darkness or separation or secrecy. He's not afraid. He's not inconvenienced. He wants to be there. This is, there's this phrase that we pass over at the very beginning of this. Jesus crossed again to the other boat to the other side. A large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. He stayed close to the sea as if he were waiting there for something. Not interrupted by Jairus, expecting him. Ready to be inconvenienced. God is never interrupted. God just has plans. You are not interrupting him. You are not an inconvenience to him. And so I think the question needs to be, first, if we recognize like we are worthy of asking big things of God, that we are not inconveniencing him, we are not a burden, that our problems are not less than other people's. He cares for our problems just as he cares for everyone else's. And even though we may see the immense burdens and sufferings of other people in other parts of the world, he cares for us and loves us the same wants to be present to us and our needs the same. Then the question is, what does God need to restore in you? What does God want to make whole again in you? And brothers and sisters, he wants to do it in all of who you are, not just in part. Because when a lot of people come forward to the Lord and they ask for things, especially if they ask for, for uh, healing from illness, a lot of people come forward and they just want to be cured. Jesus is not in the business of curing people. He's in the business of healing people. And healing is mind, body, and soul. It's the whole of who you are. 
He doesn't just want a quick fix. That's why he's never just, all right, you can walk again, but he's also, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go show yourself to the priest. Be restored in right community. These healings, they always accompany some kind of wholeness and restoration. That's what he's in the business of doing. And how does he want to do it in your life? Because brothers and sisters, you are worth that attention from the Lord. You are worth his time. And your concerns, however small they may be to you, are of the utmost importance to him. And so ask. Ask for big things from the Lord. He wants to give you big things. He wants to do miracles in your life. People often ask, why don't miracles happen anymore? And I'll usually say one of two things. They happen every day. You're just not looking for them. Or they don't happen because you're not asking for them. So what do you need the Lord to do in your life? Because he's capable. We may just be disqualifying ourselves as worthy of a miracle before we even ask. And these stories of Jairus' daughter and the hemorrhaging woman are reminding us that there is nothing too small, no state of uncleanliness or separation from God that is too far away for him to want to draw near and to pay attention even to the smallest of your needs. Questions? Comments? What stood out to you? John? Um, the Coincidence that she was 12 and 12 years of hemorrhaging. Oh, yes. Jesus was being lost at 12 in number. So oh, yes. Like, um, I know 12 in number is meaning there. Yeah. Uh, order, sickness. Yeah. So, what's the. I can sort of get the 12 years of hemorrhaging. Like, you sort of need to carry your cross as long as God wants you to carry this mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's definitely not coincidence. When you see a number in the Bible, it means something. Because remember, Hebrew is a gematria language, which means every letter has a numerical designation, and every number has a word association or other symbolic designation. And so 12, when you see 12 in the Bible, it should point you all the way back to the 12 tribes of Israel. That's the first time we really have an established sense of 12. And that signifies a completeness to the mission that God has to save and reconcile his people. And those 12 tribes had been broken. 10 had been lost, right? Which is why Jesus, when he comes and does his public ministry, how many apostles does he call? 12. To signify the restoration of the original 12 apostles, or 12 tribes of Israel. And so anytime we see 12... And especially if we see brokenness leading to restoration, it's a Hebrew or Jewish symbol for the fact that Jesus is the promised Messiah who's carrying into fruition the covenant promises of the God of the Old Testament to make right and fulfill the covenant promises that God made to Israel, even though 10 tribes had been lost. 12 was also a very significant rite of passage in Jewish culture. This was the time where... Uh, young boys would be tested if they were the best of the best students to potentially be a disciple of a rabbi. Um, this is when, uh, it's around the time that we still, uh, that our Jewish brothers and sisters still celebrate bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs right around 12, 13. So it's this like very uh, sacred time of a rite of passage. And at the time of Jesus, uh, that would have been the age where he would interview with a rabbi to become his disciple. And yet he's found at the temple and he's not interviewing, he's teaching. He's showing already at 12, he understands that his role is not to be taught by others, but to lead and to teach. And so there's a lot of significance to that number. It does, it does signify a sense of completeness, wholeness, but it's always very oriented to God's mission to restore Israel in that covenant promise, the covenant people, to bring about the salvation of all humanity through those 12 tribes. They're then lost, restored in the 12 disciples. And all these signs of 12 later on are different places signifying Jesus making right what had been distorted or gone wrong. Yeah, great question. There's other similarities here in these two stories, these two women. Um, both of them are suffering death. One is just instant death. One is a long-term death with the hemorrhaging woman. 
Um, it shows the gamut of rich and poor, right? A synagogue official would have been very wealthy, so his daughter would have been well off. The hemorrhaging woman would have been very poor. So Jesus has no disparity into those he wants to heal and serve. But both these women are unnamed. And then throughout the process of the story, they're unnamed and without community or without hope, without life. And then Jesus restores them, and the first thing he says to them is, daughter. He gives them a family member identity as he heals them, claiming them, claiming them in this family relationship that he desires to restore all of us into. The 12 years, the word for healing, sothe or sezokin, uh, is used several times in this in verse 23 and verse 34, uh, one for each. That's a word that's invoked in the Greek translation of the Old Testament for the salvation of Israel, the restoration, the complete saving and healing of the people of Israel. It's that same word that's used when the gospel writers are talking about being healed or cured, uh, the hemorrhaging woman and Jairus' daughter. And so all of that is kind of being wrapped up in these two, two stories. Very, very similar, saying very similar things, yet showing us the gamut of human experience and the possibility that Jesus has to heal and restore any of us, which is very, very cool. Other questions, thoughts, Gia? Um, when you were talking about relics, I was thinking about the arm um, or the bone of St. Jude. Yes. So when we touch something to the glass, that wasn't literally touching his bone. Is that the same thing as touching his bone? It is. So there is, um, through the authoritative ability that the church has, um, by virtue of being guided by the Holy Spirit, they can. the church can make declarations saying that in order to preserve the... Um, um, What's the word? Um, what? Yeah, preserve the 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 the, the 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 what is this? What's this word? Integrity of the relic. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to grasp for the word. Um, yeah, I'm gonna regret that gesture when I watch this later. Um, to preserve the integrity of the relic, uh, it is encased with a papal seal. The last pope who had any kind of investigation or inspection or testing done of it sealed the container. And because uh, we don't want to open that uh, and expose it to the elements, uh, further deteriorating it and not allowing it to be a conduit of grace and power of God for the, the people, um, there is a an, an, uh, papal kind of uh, declaration that is said that if it's touching the case, it's just, it's exactly the same. Yeah. So just like um, the power of Jesus is not bound by being in a tabernacle, that you can sit in the chapel and adore the Lord in the tabernacle in the same way that you can adore him in the monstrance outside of the tabernacle. There's no difference. It's not like he's like, oh, I really wish I could help you, but I'm caged up right now. Like, come back for adoration. Like, Jesus is not bound by a box, you know? There's a sensory difference. Like, we can have more of a visual experience of Christ, but he, his grace and his power is no different. Same thing is true of a relic. Yeah. Oh, that would be really funny. I wish one, I, one day one of my goals is to have like a Catholic version of SNL. And it'd be, that would, that's a skit waiting to happen. Jesus trapped in the tabernacle. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Talitha Kum? Talitha Kum, yeah. Is that Aramaic? Yes. Um, Aramaic is used very sparingly through the Gospels. Mm -hmm. It's always something that Jesus said. Is there mm -hmm. a significance by the Gospel writers? <laughs> Felt the need to do that. Well, Mark is specifically the one who includes Aramaic um, most prevalently. And it's because the audience of his gospel was very likely uh, Gentile Christians in Rome who would have had no background in Semitic languages or knowledge of it. So he explains what was said and translate it, translates it. Matthew assumes that everyone knows what he would have said in, in Aramaic because he's writing to a Jewish audience. And Luke, as he's getting these eyewitness accounts, he's very educated. He writes everything in very nice Greek. He's not going to go through the trouble of translating something into a language that people aren't going to be able to understand because Greek is a common vernacular. So there's linguistic reasons and like uh, the audience, the proposed audience of the gospel, it just wouldn't make sense otherwise. Um, they could have, but it's, that's particularly why biblical scholars think Mark highlights most of it because he's just writing what happened and because he wants to be accurate, pass on these eyewitness accounts, he's translating things that he knows his audience won't understand naturally when they read it. Yeah? Is there a purpose why Mark is fond of intercalating stories like this, or just a literary 
Uh, well, same thing happens in Matthew and Luke, and they obviously copied this from Mark, um, but they maintain the integrity of the intercalation. They don't separate it. And it, they very well could have. They could have been like, this is really odd that like this is split up. It would make more sense for the flow of the story. But if this is actually what happened, the eyewitness account says, yeah, this guy came to Jesus. He was on his way to heal his daughter. And then this lady came up. That's how the story happened. So it's kind of evidence for the historical accuracy of what happened that day. And it shows you that there is symbolism here in the way that this is sandwiched like as a literary device that the gospel authors wanted to maintain. They wanted you to see these alignments and similarities between the hemorrhaging woman and Jairus' daughter, the unnamed to daughter, the 12 years in both, and see that as a confirmation of these symbols for who Jesus was and what he was trying to do. So I think they keep it to maintain the integrity of all of those symbols and the fact that it probably really happened that way that day. Yeah, no, no, no. He's not like, oh yeah, I forgot halfway through reading this or writing this that something else happened. It's, it's probably exactly how it happened. Yeah, because we don't have a lot of intercalations in the gospel. So when they do happen, we pay very close attention to them because there's something contextually that often the gospel writer is trying to convey by telling you one thing, then taking a break and returning to it. It's kind of like he's trying to, to uh, juxtapose your perspective to better emphasize something happening in the main narrative. Um, that's usually the purpose of it. Yeah. Yeah. We touched on that briefly, like how the virus really was tested in two ways. Mm -hmm. One way by, by believing, having faith, and then in another way it's like, um, okay, like she's dead, she's died, and I have confirmation in my, my sources. Yeah. Which is another test. Yeah. It's an even bigger example. And so, like, that could lead one person to be really upset, mm -hmm. lose faith. And so, yeah. like, you know, I thought that was really interesting because, I mean, imagine someone's bleeding out in a car and, I don't know, they're going to go help help somebody on the way. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's kind of frustrating. Yeah. Um, but but uh, maybe for his, for his own sake. Yeah. Well, and there shows the intentionality of Jesus, too, right? That happens at the raising of Lazarus. Mary and Martha write to him, tell him that Lazarus is sick. He waits until Lazarus is dead, even though he's just a few towns away. He could have come, but he doesn't. He waits until Lazarus is dead for four days and then comes because he knew what he was going to do, right? Um, so, and, and I think also to that same point, Jairus risked also embarrassment. Because at this time, if someone died... The reason why there's a commotion happening here, they, they portray this very well in The Chosen, if you've seen the depiction of this. It was common for you to hire mourners. You would hire flute, people who would play the flute, which was a very instrument to signify like sadness and mourning, and then people to professionally wail. Like, oh! No idea who this dead person was. This is just their job. Because... There were no phones. There wasn't like a mass message like, okay, so-and-so died, everyone come. You would hear the wailing and you would come. And it, it was a way to show honor and dignity to the value of the life of the person who had died that you would make such a fuss about the fact that they had died. Um, so when I die, I expect all of you to be professional mourners. Am I? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Um, hire other people. I want you to really enjoy the funeral. Um, so, no, but this is, that's why he risked embarrassment, right? He sees all this commotion and then Jesus is like, she's just sleeping. I mean, he could have been like, get out of here, guy. Like, I'm a synagogue official. Like, I can't have this like on my reputation. But he, he listens to Jesus. He lets Jesus put them all out. I love, I love that line. He put them all out. I'm like, what did that look like? Just get out of here. You know, like, who knows? You know, like another, a whole nother, like flipping the tables of the money changers situation that we, we can just speculate about the one line. Um, but yeah, Jairus is willing to be humiliated. Humiliated shares the same root word as humbled, humus, which means made low to the ground. He's willing to be made low to empty himself, to rely on the power of another person, even though he has pretty, a pretty powerful position in his role and in this town. He's recognizing no matter the power that I have, in order for real power to manifest, in order for God to really act, I need to set aside my own pride to lower myself, to empty myself so that God can work. It's one of the final words of John the Baptist, right? He must increase. I must decrease.
And Jairus, I think, embodies that really powerfully in this story. Yeah? Um, you brought something to life that I didn't think about when you said the end of the, the paragraph. Mm -hmm. You said to give her something to eat. Mm -hmm. So um, proving that she's not dead when telling them to eat something is seen here, and also when Jesus arises from the dead, and he goes into the house and asks for something to eat. Yeah. So proving that you need to eat something to put you dead for a while. Yeah, and proving that you're not a ghost. Yeah, because if you were a spirit, you couldn't eat. And that's why Jesus like consumes, I think it's in the Gospel of Luke, there's a note that he like consumes fish in front of them. It says they see him consume it. And Luke is saying like that's evidence that he's a real person. He actually rose from the dead. It's not a vision, it's not a hallucination, he's not a spirit because they can't do those things. And the same thing is true here. Yeah, that's a very important point. I hadn't made the connection there. Um, further confirming that she has, in fact, been raised from the dead. Any final thoughts? Yes. Um, if God lets you suffer, no matter how much faith you have, <clears throat> you have to heal, could that kind of take away some of your purgatory time? <laughs> Depends on the disposition that you approach suffering. So the question, if you didn't hear it, it's a great question. If God lets you suffer, does that, you know, uh, take away some of your time in purgatory, potentially? It depends on your disposition, right? If, no, it's a great question. If you're doing what, you know, Jesus says not to do about prayer and, and uh, almsgiving, if you're not projecting this out to the world and saying, oh, look how great I'm suffering, but it's all for the Lord, like, that's pride. And that's probably going to add to your time in purgatory, not take it off, right? Um, but if you are really bearing that as, like, I understand that this is my cross, and that God is doing something in this. This was not his plan. Remember the first reading. Pay attention to those words when you hear them on Sunday. God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. God is not in the business of wanting suffering or causing it. He is in the business of restoring and fixing it. But it is a reality of our world because of free will. Uh, and so God will use it to bring about a good. And so that possibility is always there for us. But we can handle the situation poorly. And we can lash out at God, we can become atheists, we can reject him, we can become angry, all of which will create further separation and obstacles between us and God, uh, further attachments to sin or pride or selfishness, all of which will mean more time potentially in purgatory. Um, obviously, all that depends on the state in which we die and how many good works we've done and how we've made up for that already. But like overall, you know, um, however, we as Catholics believe in redemptive suffering which is the opposite of the health and wealth gospel, the prosperity gospel, very, very popular in the United States with pastors like Joel Osteen. The predominant belief that if I do good things, if I'm a good person, and if I do the things that I'm supposed to do as a Catholic, good things will happen to me. I will have money, I will be successful, I will be healthy and wealthy, and that does not align with anything in the Bible. I don't know how it happens. I don't know how someone like thought of this when you like look at the crucifix and like the prime model for the Christian life was not healthy or wealthy in this moment. Like, how do you come to this conclusion? It makes no sense. But there are a lot of people that believe that. We get people here all the time who, who say things where it's like, wow, you've really absorbed this from our culture. It's a very kind of new evangelical idea in the past like generation or two. That like, if I just do good things, if I give enough money, God will pour back abundance in my life. It's not promised anywhere. Abundance is promised, but not necessarily in this life and not necessarily physical or earthly standards of abundance. Spiritual abundance is what is promised. And that will come in many forms in this life and abundantly in the next, for sure. But not the wealth not the health, not the prosperity. And so redemptive suffering is the reality and a very Catholic thing where when we suffer, instead of asking, why me, Lord? We ask, what is this for, Lord? Who is this for? Who can I offer this for? In the same way that you offered your suffering for us on the cross, I can offer my suffering in a much smaller, less significant way as a prayer for someone else. And that can be incredibly redemptive. That in itself is a beautiful good work that detaches us from sin and selfishness in the ways that purgatory is designed to do. So absolutely, if we approach it in that sense, 
But if we have in mind, I'm only doing this so I get time off in purgatory, again, wrong disposition. So if we all authentically are saying, no, I really want to offer this. I really want to offer. And there have been many saints who have suffered horrific pain. I'm thinking particularly, I believe, Blessed Chiara Badano. Uh, she died in her 20s, or early 20s, of a, a, an inflamed injury from a tennis injury or something like that. And she refused pain medication because she wanted to feel the sufferings more deeply so as to better offer them for the sake of others. That's what she desired. So she refused like pain medication and all of that. From this very, it was a very rare and painful disease that she ended up being diagnosed with. A lot of other saints share that same story. And so it's not, it's doesn't, not church teaching that when you suffer, you have to endure it as badly as possible and offer it for other people. Like that's not, the church doesn't demand that of us, but it is offered as a path to redemption for us and for others. And so just shifting that mentality, instead of why me, who is this for? What is this for? There's a very confusing passage, I believe it's in Colossians, where it says, I make up what is lacking in the suffering of Christ. Paul writes that. I make up what is lacking in the suffering of Christ. Well, is Christ's suffering for our salvation lacking? No. But what's missing is our participation in it. And so when we participate in the suffering of Christ by offering our suffering and aligning it to him, then that offering becomes more abundant for us and for others. There's a very beautiful teaching. So if you don't know anything about redemptive suffering, look it up. Look it up in the catechism. It's a very profoundly beautiful invitation for all of us because suffering will come, brothers and sisters. And what we do with it in that time of testing is a, is a profound opportunity to either, in, in Rick's terms, add or take away to our time in purgatory, but especially to offer it for others' redemption and salvation. Um, so... It's a beautiful invitation. Uh, and I think, again, to remind you of the beautiful invitation of the, this passage this week, to be recogni recognize the fact that God cares about the little things in your life. God cares about your needs. God cares about um, all the things that you think might be insignificant. You are not an inconvenience or a burden to him. You are allowed to exist and take up space. And the things you go through and the things that are, are, um, you're struggling with have value. Do not cast them aside because he doesn't. He wants to be there. He's not afraid to draw close to the things that you are afraid to even touch or bring into the light. They will not make him unclean. He will make them clean. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this time and your word. Thank you for the ways it spoke to us and will continue to speak to us throughout this week. I pray, Lord, that you would write the words that resonated with us from tonight on our hearts that we may carry them with us, reflect on them, to hold them deeply and profoundly in the ways that you are beautifully inviting us to be in deeper relationship with you and to continue to reveal the good work you are doing in us throughout the course of this week. And when we hear this again this Sunday to allow new things to unfold and blossom for us as you seek to be more and more present, to draw ever closer to even the most insignificant details of our life because you love us that much. Thank you, Lord. And we pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.